Hi, I'm back. Uh, now, as I said in the last video about the unforgivable sin, I want to make a video about 10 safeguards, how we can safeguard ourselves from ever going down that path. Now, as I said in the other video, it is very difficult to commit the unforgivable sin, but it is not difficult to start down the path of doing so. So I do not want anybody viewing these videos to be afraid that they committed the unforgivable sin. If you are afraid you committed it, it's likelihood you haven't, to be honest. And if anyone's watching this video before watching the last one about the unforgivable sin, I suggest you go and watch the first video that I made first and then come back to this one for a better understanding. Anyway, there are 10 ways, at least 10 ways, we can safeguard ourselves from ever committing blasphemy against the Holy Spirit apostasy. The first one is accepting that the Bible is the divine word of God. Now the first thing that atheists and people of other religions will bash when it comes to Christianity is the Bible and there's good reason for that. A lot of the Bible doesn't make sense to human intellect or understanding. There are a lot of on the surface very offensive things written in there. I'm not saying the Bible is through and through offensive but it is offensive to people's human, human nature and to their human sentiment. And I always say the Bible is either one of two things. Either it's divinely inspired by God, or it's a book made by men. Now, if it is a book made by men, why would men write a book like that? Think about it. All of the books that people write in history, they want to write to make a good impression. Even the Quran isn't really openly as offensive to human nature as the Bible is. So why why would humans write a book that is so offensive to hu to other humans? Why why would they do that? For me, it takes me a greater amount of faith to believe that the Bible would be man-made than to believe it's the inspired word of God. Now, obviously, you do need to put your faith to believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. And obviously, looking at it like that, you may not get all the answers to the questions you want regarding difficult verses, because we do have to accept that God is divine, we are not. And part of not committing the unforgivable sin is accepting that God is indeed divine, that he is not somebody who we can just merely understand. He is above our comprehension and understanding. So therefore, when we look at the Bible, when people criticise the Bible and say, well, what about that verse? What about this verse? Doesn't God seem to condone this and condone that? People are viewing the Bible according to the lenses of their own human intellect and according to their own human reason. But human beings are not divine. We do not have the divine intellect. We do not have the divine understanding. If the Bible is indeed the word of God, and I believe that it is, fully believe, then it cannot all be understood by human intellect. You need the Holy Spirit to reveal verses to you. I'm not saying by this that we should never ask questions about things or that it's sinful to ask questions about things. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is when you don't get the answer, no one can give you the answer, you have to understand that that doesn't mean there isn't an answer that is satisfactory. There may well be an answer that is in the mind of God that is satisfactory to that. And there are a great many Christians who have walked away from their faith because of some stumbling block within the, in the Bible that they haven't understood or they haven't been able to accept. Sometimes you just got to, to accept that it is a divine inspired word of God. Because at the end of the day, why would men write it? Think about it. Why, why would any man write it? It's like when you look at the life of Jesus. Either Jesus is God as he said he was, it's like he said, I am, I am him, I am the I am, who I am is the, the name for, for God, it's derived from the name Yahweh, which is the name for God, the Jewish name for God, it's not a perfect interpretation of God's name, but it's the name we have, and that it basically means I am, so Jesus said, before the world was, I am, so Jesus basically said, I am God, okay, now, he is either God, as he claims he is, and that's what I fully 100% believe and know in my heart, or he's a lunatic, and not only a lunatic, but a dangerous lunatic. 
And if you are to believe, come to the conclusion after meeting with Christ and knowing Christ in your heart that he is a dangerous lunatic, there is no way back from you from that. So it's important to believe that he is who he said he is. He said, I am the son of God. I am, I am, I am. And that's who he is. He is God, fully divine, as well as being fully human. So that's important. Accept the word of God as a divine word of God, the divine Bible. Number two, worship him. Now, many people will make the comment, well, why does God need our worship? He doesn't. He doesn't need your worship. You worship him for your sake. You worship him because that is your right response to the divine glorious being that is God. If you don't worship God, you become estranged from him. Our worship to God is more for us than it is for God. It's more for, um, the, like the psalmist said, um, better is one day in your presence than a thousand day, days anywhere else. That's what the psalmist said, David said, and that, that's true. We should delight in worshipping the Lord. We should have a delight in wanting to praise him and worship him because he's worthy of our worship and he's worthy of our praise and worthy of our ador adoration because he was the supreme divine being. He, his nature is fully good and fully God and everything about his nature is perfectly balanced within him to make the righteous decisions. We may not always understand, we aren't always understand what he says, but we trust him and we put our faith in him. And that's very, very important. So worship him. Make a habit of worshipping every day. I'm not saying for hours and hours. Maybe one worship song that you remember, just singing along to him in the car, whatever, on the way to work. It helps keep you away from apostasy or going down that path. Very, very important. Number three, forgive everyone. Unforgiveness is a doorway for Satan to get involved in your life. Unforgiveness will just twist you up and spit you out. Even atheists will agree that unforgiveness is not a good thing. It's really not. Um, and as Christians, we can't. We need to be forgiving people. And when we can't, we need to be asking the Holy Spirit to help us and empower us to forgive other people because that is really important. Otherwise, we, we become estranged from God. We go down the path towards apostasy. Number four, if you lose a debate against an atheist, make sure that you're some from another religion make sure you discuss that with your church and, and whatnot why did you lose the debate what what was discussed what what did you fail on you know what 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 happened how do you feel about that you know do you feel yourself being dragged along to believing as the atheist does that's a load of cosmolet you know have you had that experience of christ that you know it's not cosmolet so how do you discuss that when you lose a debate against an atheist or someone of a, of a different religion? Um, if there's tough questions that the atheists or whatever has asked, talk to your pastor about it, talk to other people about it. And if you can't get an answer, then maybe there is no answer. It's just how it is. Maybe there just isn't an answer that we can know this side of the grave. Five, ask God for mercy often. God is merciful. It says in the scriptures, his mercy is a true, a, a new every day. Fall on his mercy. Ask him for his mercy. He wants to be merciful. He says in his scriptures, I delight in mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Or something along those lines. And it also says that mercy will not be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. So also be merciful. If you've got someone on the end of your hook, let them go. Don't hold them on a hook. Number six, make your secret sin public. If you're, if you're engaged in secret sin, like masturbation or pornography, tell somebody. Tell a, a trusted Christian that you're struggling with that. Bring it out into the light, where, because Satan likes to operate in the darkness. He likes to pull you away from Christ in the darkness. If you bring things into the light, he can't do that. Confession is part of repentance and turning away from sin. So if you're stuck in a sin repent cycle, tell somebody, tell somebody you trust, a Christian you trust, that is not going to judge and condemn you for it, but at the same time will stand with you against that sin. Very, very important. Number seven, journal. Keep a journal. Tell God how you feel. Be, be honest with God. Uh, pour your heart out to him in the journal. 
let him know, sing praises to him, worship him in that journal. And um, it's really important to keep that journal. My journal is very, very precious to me, very precious. Number eight, go to a good church. Don't go to a bad church. Don't go to a church that is either too legalistic or too carefree. Go to a church that is preaching the right messages. Go to a church that they actually have a hunger and a thirst to be filled with the actual Holy Spirit. Don't go to a dead church. Don't go to one of these mega churches where it's like a, a cinema where they, they just care about giving a seeker-friendly gospel, but they don't really care about the power of God. Don't go to one of those churches. Go to a, a smaller church that where they're really hungry for the Word of God. They're really hungry to move in the in the gifts and, and, and fruits of the Holy Spirit. Be in one of those sort of churches. Be in one of those sort of churches that, that shows love. Make sure you're in a good church. Make sure you go to church. Do, don't forsake the meeting together with the brethren. It's very, very important. Number nine, do not simply believe all the sermons you hear. Don't just sit there on a Sunday morning and believe everything the preacher says. It says in scripture to be a good Berean and seek out from the scriptures what God is testifying in your heart is true of those scriptures. Because people can give false sermons, even in true churches. So you need to ask the Holy Spirit, is this of you or not? And um, does it does it comply to the, the Bible? You know, does it does it give that pattern away? Number 10, and I love this one, read Job. Read the book of Job. If you're struggling and think you want to walk away from the Christian faith, just sit down and read Job. Read it all the way through. It's a it's a real powerful book against the temptation to be an apostate. Particularly the end of Job, um, chapters 38 to 41, where uh, God addresses Job from the storm. And you really see how divine God is in comparison to Job and his, his three twits um, that are trying to help him. You know, you, you, you get that sense of the awe of God and the power of God. And you realise that th this God really is God. You know, he really is the, 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 the saviour. So, you know, if you're struggling and you think, you know, I'm not really feeling it, read Job. So that is that is my 10 safeguards that you can put in place to avoid going down the pathway of apostasy and the unforgivable sin. Thank you for watching.